You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. What is up, good people? Hello, I'm coming at you from the Shred Shed yet again. If you have listened to the last few episodes, you know that I've had a rather interesting last few weeks, especially if you follow along on the socials and you're a part of the Tone Mob Facebook group and the Discord and all that stuff, you know I've had quite an interesting last few weeks. I was in Seattle recording with my dude Daniel, and fast forward to less than a week later, I find myself in Nashville. Literally, Scott Marcourt from Stringjoy, you know, my business partner, he messaged me on a Monday and said, Hey, I know we talked about this last week. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But how soon can you get here and how long can you stay? So the next day, literally woke up Monday, looking at a normal-ish week, whatever that means for me. Tuesday, I'm flying to Nashville all of a sudden. So I was there for not quite a week. I got back yesterday as I record this. And I can't go over all of the details just yet, but... Very, very, very soon, it will become very apparent why I had to fly down. It's one of the very rare good emergencies. It was a a good problem to have, as people say, but a problem nonetheless, and we were able to smash through it, and the team is, the team down there is just incredible. They do such amazing work, and it was so fun to, like, dive in and get my hands dirty again. I've done it before, but This time I actually made a few strings, so some people will be playing some strings that I personally made, which is kind of crazy. I know that obviously there's people there that make strings every day, but for me, it's kind of wild to know that there are a handful of strings floating out in the world that are going to be played by people and making music, and that's kind of, kind of cool. Oh yeah, and I totally glossed over the fact that we have a brand new string. We made a totally new string line, and we've been working on it for, I don't even know how long at this point, a long time, lots of testing, lots of theorizing, lots of experimentation, and now we actually have coded electric strings. I know we've talked about the Foxwoods, or I've talked about the Foxwoods on here before, which are our coded phosphor bronze acoustic strings, and now we have the Orbiters, which are our coded electric strings. Both of these lines were designed for people like myself and Scott and most of the team down there who really don't like coded strings. I've never enjoyed what has been offered on the market, and now we've made a coded string that has that longevity that plays and feels and sounds like a traditional uncoded string, which is just fantastic. In fact, these are actually a little brighter. In both instances, we've been able to make a string that sounds a little more articulate than its uncoded brother, which I know sounds crazy, but it's totally true. So yeah, they're pretty incredible. They're not for everybody, but we're super stoked on them. So if you want something that feels like a uncoded string, but lasts like a coded string, check out the Orbiters. This may be the string for you. And wow, I did not intend on turning that into a big, long you know, basically sponsorship spot. So apologies for that. There's just been so much happening since I last published this episode. Oh yeah, and I should say the the launch of the Orbiters isn't even why I went down there. There's a totally separate reason that will become apparent very, very soon. But hey, I should shut up. I should shut up so we can start talking to Ayla, which is the whole reason you are here. You're here for this conversation, not me blabbering in the night by myself incoherently. Let's go, let's get into this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar stuff occasionally, sometimes. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have Ayla Tesler Mabe. How's it going? It's going very well. Thank you. I'm so excited that we're finally doing this. I know. I'm it's so been a long happy. time coming. <laughs> oh, man. We've had a wild ride trying to make this happen. Yeah. So we're finally doing it. That's, mm-hmm. This is awesome. 
you know, thanks to Natalie for hooking us up. Natalie's been awesome over the years in various capacities, and this wouldn't have happened without her. Yeah. And uh, she's how I found your stuff. And I started going down the rabbit hole. You've done so many cool things. I mean, I just I'm kind of blown away, to be honest. So this is a this is a real treat. So I think the best place to start would be with your backstory. Like, when did you get started playing? And then, like, how how do you go from, hmm, guitar looks cool to, oh, now I'm playing on a Willow Smith song? Like, how does that happen? <laughs> well, you know, I ask myself the same question often. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it started when I was playing rock band every single day. Mm -hmm. I was in love with that game. Shout out to my mom, because she somehow knew that buying that game would lead to something because she could just tell that me and my brother loved music. Uh, mm. And yeah, it was, it was so fun. Uh, I'd play all the time, but everything really changed when she came back from the store one day with Beatles rock band, when it had just come out, that was maybe like 2010, 2009, something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I just fell in love and something about, that music and the concept of being in a band and everything the Beatles did made me feel like that's the only thing I could really see myself doing in the future. And that's when I knew I should start playing an instrument because you yeah. kind of needed an instrument to uh, create music if that's what you want to do. So yeah, yeah, I, I got a really cheap guitar and I took two lessons and I was like, ah, I don't know, maybe it's not for me, you know, the way kids do. Right. And um, I did start playing the bass a few years after that when I was 12. And then after I'd been playing for, actually, that's not true. I started playing the bass probably when I was 10 or 11. And then after a year and a half of playing, uh, I finally started gigging um, and making a bit of money, which was really cool and exciting, but still... Nice. I had this feeling that the guitar was what I was meant to be doing. And that's when I got into the guitar at full force when I was 12. And then it just became this obsession and this love. I spent hours and hours and hours every day. Um, I don't want to say practicing. It doesn't even feel like that. Just exploring music, learning songs I loved, trying to write, kind of just doing whatever I enjoyed with mm -hmm. music. Yeah. Yeah. And then... How I got to the whole Willow Smith thing, I mean, it's it's hard to even, I guess, recount every step that would have led there. But uh, I think probably it had something to do with being in Calpurnia for a time because I did this music program. That's where I met Finn and Malcolm, um, who were two of the guys in Calpurnia. Mm -hmm. And I think it was through Calpurnia that Willow found out about me and we sort of connected a little bit over the years. And then... I reached out during the pandemic just to check in and see how she was doing. And we were talking about books we were reading and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, she mentioned she was working on new music. And then she was like, hey, maybe you should do a verse on one of my songs and play a solo. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> that sounds yeah. great. So it was very organic, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the abridged, but still kind mm -hmm. of lengthy version of how I got to that point. <laughs> Oh, we're only four minutes. We've got we've got a ton of time to kill. <laughs> this is going to be a... As I tell people, it gets weird when you stop talking on a podcast. So talk as much as you want. It's absolutely okay. encouraged. <laughs> I guess that's what podcasts are for, right? That's right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a blabbermouth, so therefore I podcast. That's what I do. <laughs> so were you in any bands before Calpurnia? Did you have some more like stepping stone activities totally. leading up to that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I... I kind of had this philosophy, uh, and to a degree, I'd say I still have it, where I say yes to pretty much everything, any opportunity mm -hmm. that's put in front of me, because I feel like you never really know what something could lead to down the line. And I'm trying to think, I mean, I played in a lot of bands, uh, pretty much as soon as I started. When I started on bass, the first paying gig I had um, when I was 13, was in this Led Zeppelin cover band called Kid Zeppelin because um, they were doing a <laughs> Led Zeppelin exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery. So we did some stuff there, which was really cool. That that was really fun. 
Uh, I have fond memories about that. Um, and then I had a band with two friends from school. We really just played covers, but we played a lot over the years. And uh, there was another friend who, for a brief moment, was in that band before he left the school. But yeah, uh, one of the guys in that band, Jack, ended up being the bass player in Calpurnia. And then um, okay. the other friend, Charlie, he is in Toronto right now, still doing music, which is awesome. And he has another band going on there, uh, which is really, really cool. And I played a lot with my teacher, Sammy Gowie, and his band, uh, pretty much from the time I was 15 or 16 when I met him. I don't remember exactly when. Because he was... Mm-hmm the music director for this gig I did with a friend of mine named Maya Ray, who's so cool. She's doing some really cool stuff now uh, nice. with her trio, Tiny Habits. Um, but yeah, we did a gig together. He was the music director. He became my teacher. And then I performed pretty much every weekend for years uh, with him and his band, which was the most amazing experience because they were incredible musicians. And I would show up to all their gigs and they wouldn't even tell me what they were playing. And it got to a point where Sammy wouldn't even tell me <laughs> the key of the song. He would just start playing and he'd be like, make it sound good. <laughs> and I'd try to find my place in the music right. and try to add to what they were doing and not take away from what they were doing, obviously, <laughs> mm-hmm. which, which was amazing for trying to develop musical instincts because it's, yeah, it became very apparent to me that it's not just about learning how to play the instrument. You need to learn how to play music and understand what your guitar playing does for the music you're playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, very quickly, he helped me identify bad habits, you know, when I was playing in places where I shouldn't be and wasn't taking a supporting role in the music and yeah, he'd, he'd ask me so many amazing questions, you know, asking me why pretty much any note I played was there in the first place. And then that kind of led to where I am today, where I really try to always think about that because I think ego death is the best thing a musician could experience if they want to really like play for the music and, you know, just always prioritizing what you're actually contributing to the music you're playing and never letting mm-hmm. ego or the want to impress people or whatever get in the way, which was so important and amazing to learn as a teenager, uh, learning the guitar, right. because, I, I mean, teenagers are narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> it was great to be put in my place by someone older and wiser and a fantastic musician. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean... I never had that problem because I'm not that good. So I just had to learn how to talk about the instrument <laughs> instead of actually play it for people. It's, Ugh, I'm not going to impress anybody with my chops. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I do totally understand. That's, I mean, when I first started playing, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be Yngwie. Like, I right. wanted to shred and like everybody be like, whoa, look at that guy. And I think you're right. Having that realization that that wasn't going to happen, you know, for me uh, was important because mm-hmm. then it was like, OK, it's that's not really that critical. You know, the song is what matters. 100%. What can you do for the song? That's really all it comes down to. And sometimes that's one note yeah. held for a really long time. You know, Absolutely. You know, it, it, it could be anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, it's so fun to listen to those uh, James Brown recordings um, where there were like two or three guitar players on the track, but every part was so perfect. They're so in the pocket. Um, and sometimes one of the players was literally just playing like one or two notes. But yeah. without it, the song would not groove as hard as it does. Uh, so they're exactly. bringing something essential, but they were not in any way overstepping what they needed to bring. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's pretty cool. I was just playing. On, this is the first time I've really done this for anything that I wasn't directly involved in, but I was just playing on a friend's record this weekend and I was doing most, uh, pretty much all of the guitar on it. And, you know, I, I usually use a lot of reverb and take up a lot of space (laughs) and, uh, you know, he left me room to do that, but we were, we were trying to figure out, there was like, Oh, there needs to be a lead. There needs to be something in here. We couldn't quite figure it out. And I'm doing all kinds of stuff all over the fretboard. And none of it's working. And then it was literally like grabbed a 12 string Rickenbacker and oh, played nice. two notes. Do, do, 
do and it was just that back and forth it was like that's it and we both knew when it happened because i was playing all this other stuff just kind of improvising and then i just hit those two notes and then he turned around in his chair i was like yeah that's the that's the part right that's all i need to do i just need to do that over and over again he's like yeah that's that's the thing it's so weird how sometimes that's all it is and yeah. we overthink it you know absolutely I yeah the, you I mean you hear a lot of space in music and you think i have to fill it up i guess but right it's the way you do it um sometimes exactly as you said it doesn't have to be much it just needs to be something memorable maybe a good hook something something cool and sometimes something that's cool two notes yeah. <laughs> that's right one note two notes yeah three chords i mean the whole world was changed with power chords Indeed. you know yeah so it doesn't have to we don't have to overcomplicate things we no. we always try to but we don't have to that's true a fact yeah i mean i've always felt kind of envious in a way of people who are like very limited in their technical ability as players and i'm i by no means consider myself a highly technical player i think there are probably at least a couple kids in every high school everywhere in the world who could outshred me. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, Cause I was maybe, never really in intention. No, I think so. I think so. Especially when it comes to technical ability. Uh, but I think, yeah, when I, when I got into songwriting, I was almost overwhelmed with, where do I even go from here? How do I even write a song? Because I mm -hmm. was trying to think of the most complicated thing. You know, what was at the upper limits of my ability as a musician? How do I write with that? Before I understood intention and, you know, um, reached the point I am now as a songwriter. But yeah, I would look at some people I knew or old school musicians like, I don't know, Bob Dylan, Lou Reed people who, you know, were fairly limited in their technical ability, who in a way were then able to write with the song in mind first, because there was just like no thought of, like, I, I don't think Bob, Del Bob Dylan would ever be like, what's the most impressive thing I can play on guitar? How do I write with right. that in my, obviously, <laughs> right? Like that just even sounds ridiculous to say. Uh, but yeah, as a guitar player who has really worked to develop guitar playing ability, it can be hard to, again, get to a place where you prioritize the song over your guitar playing <laughs> and mm -hmm. your shredding in quotations or whatever it is, because obviously that's a huge part of guitar playing culture. And it's really, I think, crucial to try and shift that mindset and hard to do because it feels almost like you're not supposed to do that as a guitar player but i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about you know the most quote unquote important or influential rock bands over the course of time it's not necessarily the ones that just blew people's faces off with their technical mastery sometimes it is but nirvana was a direct like counter to that idea yeah essentially and yeah. they just absolutely changed everything you know, mm -hmm. hair metal was all about that showmanship and that technical, that shreddery look at a million notes a minute. That was what it was all about. Yeah. And they came along and were just like, no, we're done with that. Yeah. We're I just, mean, the whole punk movement, the whole grunge movement. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's very cool. And I mean, even in jazz, I think there's a similar movement, you know, when bebop was in full swing in like the 40s and 50s and whatever. Uh, Miles Davis came along and, you know, kind of wanted to do the complete opposite and you know cool jazz came about and it was like a reaction to that where it's like let's create mood instead of just trying to melt the audience's faces off right. <laughs> but yeah i mean exactly it's it, i think there's a weird disconnect uh where guitar players especially and i think this is true of most instrumentalists uh but and maybe even singers as well but we are always pushing ourselves and we have this idea, of course, you know, this sort of like pressure that for some reason exists for most people to be the most virtuosic musician you can be. But then again, that seems almost completely unrelated from the music that's actually stood the test of time. And that mm -hmm. I think was a pretty big realization for me where 
I felt this immense pressure to keep pushing myself, to be more technical, to compare myself to people who were more technical than me and whatever. But then I saw that that, again, seemed so irrelevant to creating music that actually reached people. Like, of course, there is, you know, a small... Sorry, I hope I don't offend any of the Shredder musicians <laughs> out there. But, you know, there's a small demographic of people that do look for really technically impressive music more than anything else. Obviously, there's that whole group of virtuosic shredders that came about in the 80s, especially, and then leading to today, you know, there's some unbelievable musicians, uh, you know, playing math rock and instrumental type stuff. And yeah, clearly there's there's a market for that. Uh, but when I really thought about the music that made me want to start playing in the first place and the music that I actually want to create, I was like, I don't really need to do that much technically right. to get there. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, I kind of joke with a lot of um, musicians I know now that I kind of stopped practicing guitar in a way because I feel like I can... I'm at the level where I can play all of the ideas that I have technically. So now it's just about how can I be the most creative songwriter and producer I can be? Because uh, mm -hmm. I have the technical ability to do what I need to do for those songs. And then I think if I ever felt otherwise and I had ideas for a song that were beyond my technical ability, then I guess I'd probably get back to shedding as I once did yeah. <laughs> but yeah I mean there are only so many hours in a day and I feel like I haven't yet envisioned a solo in a song that needed to be more technically crazy than something with nice vibrato and tasteful note choices hopefully I don't know but nothing nothing crazy Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just I just hope people can identify that it's me playing and they feel like there's soul in my playing. But yeah, I kind of yeah, I guess my goals have really changed over time. Um basically. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. That's that's uh, the too long to read uh <laughs> catchphrase for that whole pile of things I just said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I can relate to that though. You know, I I have said for a long time, it, I made a video that some people were kind of irritated by, but I still stand by it, that gear, if you're really into gear, it can make you a better player. Hi, I'm Vincent, and I'm here to talk about the Maris Mercury X. My dad's always going on and on about how cool Maris is. He really went off on one about the Mercury X the other day. He said something about a 4,800 hertz sample rate and 99 preset locations and 33 banks and something along the lines of the most advanced reverb pedal ever devised by man? That's all true, but I only care about one thing. This pedal sounds sick. So make sure you check out the Mercury X and all the other fine products at maris.us, as well as fine retailers worldwide. All right, Dad, all now right. can I have my talkie? How exactly do artists get their music on Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Tidal, all these services? How in the world do you get your music there? Well, in the past, you had to use something called a record label. But these days, you can use DistroKid. DistroKid is the absolute easiest way to get your music up on streaming services. And it's the most affordable way to do so. Not only do plans start at $22.99 for the entire year, that's less than two bucks a month, DistroKid also does not take a cut of your streaming revenue, unlike some other services out there. Even better if you sign up by going to ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. That's ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. One more time, that's ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. You'll get 30% off. That's right, 30% off. They're already extremely reasonable prices. So go to ToneMob.com slash DistroKid and get your music out there. 
And people are like, what? No, that's not true. The gear doesn't make the player. And I said, no, like it doesn't. But if you're really excited about your new pedal or your new guitar or your new whatever, new plugin, whatever it is, and you spend more time with your instrument as a direct result of that, it's almost impossible that you're not improving in some way, mm. shape or form. I haven't intentionally practiced in seven, eight years, probably like mm -hmm. a long time. And yeah. I'm by no means super technical, but I am way better at guitar than I was seven, eight years ago. I'm way better mm -hmm. now that I'm like deep into this gear world stuff than I was five, six years ago when I started the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now that I've had like more experience with the guitar and just playing in different scenarios and situations, I am way better. Now, that might not be that encouraging to some people who will hear me and be like, well, you're not that good. But uh, <laughs> time with the instrument matters a lot. And if gear yeah. excites you enough to spend more time with your instrument, I think you're going to be at least marginally better, if not significantly better. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think to add to that, that whole side of guitar playing, tone and gear and effects, amps, pedals, whatever, I didn't really realize until fairly recently that it essentially is production as well, because you're building this understanding of how to capture and shape sound. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you understand what overdrive does to a guitar signal versus fuzz versus distortion or how modulation works and like how you can achieve natural chorus or what it sounds like to use a chorus pedal or to use like a analog old school kind of chorus they're using back in the day. I don't know, whatever it is, that stuff completely applies to production and applies to songwriting. And I think it makes you a more intentional player as well. Um, so it's not just about like, the way that it inspires you to play more and you know ultimately become better as a technical player. But I think it probably makes you more conscious about the kind of player you want to be. And it helps you find your voice on the instrument. It helps you understand how to make things sound good because I think good tone, of course, ultimately comes from the fingers, no doubt. But if you have great tone in your fingers and you have a great ear for how to shape the tone coming from your guitar, coming from your pedals, coming from your amp, whatever. I mean, come on, you'll sound amazing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you, you make a really good point because I am not a trained, experienced recording engineer by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but I know exactly when I go into my DAW, I'm like, oh, yes, I should order whatever plugins I'm going to use or you know, I understand effects order intuitively because I've been obsessing over it on a pedal board or a table yeah. or whatever for years and years. So I understood the production side of or the engineering side a little bit better than I think your average person just because of like, oh, well, yeah, if I put a compressor in the chain, it's you know, here, it's going to react differently than if I put it here. Yeah. You know? And a, a lot of people don't come into recording with that knowledge at all. I'm still learning. I have a long way to go. But having that background helped out a ton with absolutely you know, learning to record myself. And I took I didn't know I didn't really know that until I started diving in. I didn't realize I was like, Oh, I do have a leg up a little bit, you know, than if I just started from zero and tried with an acoustic guitar. I'm like, well, it doesn't sound good. I don't know what to do. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been amazing for me this journey of uh, stepping into what I'm doing now, I really would hope that I continue to hone this identity of being a songwriter and a producer and, you know, just like an artist first. Uh, but, you know, when I started playing, it was mostly just with the intention of being a guitar player. And then slowly I had the realization that good guitar playing doesn't really mean much unless it's, on a good song or a great mm -hmm. song even. So then that's where the songwriting passion came from and the ambition to push myself as a songwriter. But then even that wasn't enough because it wasn't just about like writing chords 
and putting a melody over it and lyrics over it for me. I wanted to shape the whole song, but I was like, oh, but I'm not a producer. I can't do that. But then Sammy, this teacher I was talking about, this amazing person. Uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, he he kind of stopped me in this kind of self-doubt, um, oh, I'm not a producer kind of narrative. And he was like, but aren't you doing that? Haven't you been doing that since you started playing guitar? Like you are obsessed with your tone. You work so hard at crafting sound just with your guitar. How is that not production? And I was like, oh, maybe you're onto something here. And then when I started mm -hmm. writing songs and creating demos and like producing them, I realized that exactly as you said, so much of that knowledge, I, I was already completely using um, to create guitar tones and it yeah. applies, right? Like, yeah, okay, maybe you're not putting compressor on a guitar signal. You could be putting it on your vocal and you could be thinking about how that interacts with a bit of overdrive that you're adding. Oh, are you putting the overdrive before or after the compressor? I don't know, like little things that um, are part of production. And then I realized over time how all of it applies. And yeah, it just gave me this incredible understanding of what my tastes are, <laughs> what kind of sounds I want to create, and then hopefully how I can try to do that. And it's been amazing leading up to now where I'm finally recording music on my own. Because of course I'm still recording with my band Ludic and doing other projects, but for the first time I'm getting in the studio on my own. I'm like, I'm just going to see what happens if I create music. So I'm going to play mm -hmm. all the instruments because I know what I want them to sound like. I know I'm not the best drummer out there, but I know what I want it to sound like. So, all right, I'll play the part. I'll play the keys. I'll play the bass, whatever. Um, I'm there with the sound engineer and I'm like, you know, working with him to try and capture the sounds that I'm hoping to. And I guess being a producer, which is really, really cool. <laughs> and yeah, I guess it never occurred to me that what I was doing as a 13 year old trying to understand how Jimmy Page got his guitar tone and, you know, trying to emulate that and sculpt my tone to sound like his or whatever, that would lead to where I am now. Though, of course, now it seems very obvious, but at the time it would have seemed impossible and would have Absolutely. seemed like a crazy thing to even consider. But yeah. The solo stuff, like doing things on your own, I found I, I just did this in 2021 and now it's kind of like all I want to do mm -hmm. is just make make my own music with and I stopped putting I I, I could see how this goes not well with some people's thought process but for me just plugging into whatever I want to plug into and just seeing what comes out has been the best thing I could do versus like I want to make a punk rock song or I want to make a country song or I want to make a whatever for my stuff. Now, if I'm working on somebody else's thing, I can get into that mindset a little easier. And it's not as close to me personally, because it's I'm more acting as an instrument for what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But when I'm making my own stuff, I don't really like the concept of limiting myself to like, this is a metal song. So play metal, I just plug into whatever is inspiring me at the moment. And if metal comes out, then metal comes out. Yeah. If folk comes out, then folk comes out. That can lead to uh, projects being a little bit disjointed, but I find that it the individual pieces are much more inspired and much more fun to play yeah. and much more fun for me to listen to because they actually mean something versus trying to force something that wasn't coming natural at the time. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah, um, I think genre is dead. <laughs> We're in a post-genre yeah, world in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, as long as you're clear on the intention of the piece of music and what you're trying to say, either emotionally or the kind of story or a kind of perspective you're trying to get across with the music, then I think genre is almost irrelevant. Uh, and yeah, I almost don't even consider stuff like that anymore. Like I love hearing bits and pieces of all the music that inspires me in a song, even if it seems 
crazy, but I don't know. I, I find it super fun and I find it really enjoyable to let myself do that. Um, cause I've definitely been in situations where not all of my collaborators felt as open to incorporating other influences so freely, but mm -hmm. I like doing that. It's, it's fun because I love so much diverse music that almost seems like it wouldn't fit together but it, when you really get to the heart of it you can find for example i don't know a groove metal song like pantera could be coming from the same emotional place as a vivaldi piece i don't know like they could be mm -hmm. capturing a similar emotion in a really different way but if you think about how the music relates in that way or in the scenery yeah. that it paints it's a lot easier to pull from all these different styles and still make it cohesive because I don't know, you're just taking bits and pieces from history. It feels like, but creating something new uh, and paying tribute to the music you love, but then kind of doing it in the most loving way where you, <laughs> you know, are only paying tributes to the parts of those songs that actually really inspire you. It almost feels like a more honest, love letter because you're not just taking all parts of the song like for example let's say you love surf rock and you <laughs> want to write something that sounds like a surf rock band from the 60s that you love but you don't genuinely love all parts of it that almost feels like a dishonest tribute if you want to truly pay tribute to them and take influence from them and move things forward you would only be inspired by the things that you're genuinely inspired by if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. it makes sense. <laughs> no, I think I think it does. You know, there's there's elements in so many things that like, man, I love the breakdown in this song. Yeah. But the verses are kind of weak for me, you know, like it does it it varies, whatever the part may be. There's always you always have a favorite part mm -hmm. in a song. Yeah. You know, when it comes along, everybody knows it. It may be the verses for some people. It's that's why music is great, because it can mean different things to different people. But yeah, take take what you need from whatever it is and run with it and see where it leads you because you never know. Yeah. You never know what, what could happen. You never know who could hear it. And then maybe, you know, in two weeks, you're playing on somebody else's thing that you didn't ever expect to. That's happened to me a few times recently. And it never would have happened if I hadn't just put myself out there. That's a recurring theme on this podcast is just put it out there. Yeah. Because I was scared to for a really long time. I was even like, scared to start this when I first started like oh who's gonna listen to this who's gonna care why would I don't even bother don't even start just keep doing your your thing that you're doing and it's just a terrible mindset and I think so many people get stuck in that mindset it's like a natural human reaction to want to not put yourself out there but this day and age like what's the worst that's gonna happen you get an a troll or two like it's the, the yeah. upside versus the downside is so much larger, mm -hmm. you know, and if nobody if nobody sees it, then what are you out? We are brought to you today by Sweetwater, specifically the gear exchange. You may have heard about this. This is a place where you can go to buy and sell your used gear. Maybe you got a pedal over there that's just kind of collecting dust. Maybe there's something you've been eyeing from the Sweetwater catalog. Well, Right now is a great time to turn that unused gear into something you're actually going to use. Even better, if you sell on the gear exchange, you can keep 100% of the sale as long as you choose a Sweetwater gift card as your payout method. That is not too shabby, because let's be honest, most of this buying and selling we do is just to fund new gear purchases, and that is a great way to reach a wide variety of customers and keep 100% in your pocket or rather on your pedal board so go check out the sweetwater gear exchange and turn that unused gear into something that's actually going to help you write that next huge riff hello there i'd like to introduce you to your new best friend the chase bliss audio lossy Lossy is a collaboration between Chase Blitz and Good Hertz. It's meant to give you some control over those weird 
digital artifacts that come with very compressed audio. You're hearing it right now. All the changes that are taking place are strictly coming from my playing dynamics. I'm just interacting with the pedal and letting it do its thing. And some true stereo goodness. If you'd like some more details about Lossy, I invite you to head over to chaseflintsaudio.com. I think you're going to like what you find. Okay, nobody saw it. Try again next time. Yeah. You know, it, it's you've got to put things out there. I I say this all the time. And fortunately, some people have actually paid attention and and done that because it's literally changed my life. Putting things out there has completely changed my life. Mm-hmm. I'm just some ex mechanic dude. Like I'm not anybody special. I never thought I would do anything musical related for a job ever. And now here I am. And it's I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah. You got to put something out there. That's super so. cool. Wow. But yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that just comes from fear of rejection, which again is a very human thing to feel. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, I think it um, kind of comes down to that whole ego death thing, I guess, where you're. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I think. Back. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, like what I was saying about like, say yes to everything. I don't think I'm, I mean, of course I have to be a little bit more cautious with my time now, now that I'm busy. Um, and, you know, I have to think a little hours, bit that more. That hours in the day thing comes exactly. back, right? Time is mm-hmm. like the one thing you can't really get back, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, in general, still, I find myself saying yes to opportunities that a lot of people ask me, oh, why would you do that? Like, what do they bring? And they're maybe looking at it with more of a, I don't know, clout lens, I almost want to say, like, you know, what are the numbers? I don't get it. I don't understand why you're um, so open to working with someone. But I don't know. It's like, at the end of the day, if you connect with someone and you believe in what they're doing, I don't know, you'll feel fulfilled doing it. And then also, again, you have no idea where it's going to lead. Because I feel like almost all of the doors that have opened in my life are ones that I could never have even imagined would exist. They just seem so outside of the realm of what anyone would have thought would have happened, if that makes sense. But um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I think you just never really know. And I can think of so many examples like that in my life. It's really interesting. So, I mean... uh, that's definitely a quality I hope I never lose because I want to always be surprised by <laughs> things, you know, presenting themselves as opportunities um, that I never really expected. It's, you know, the, the thing about never knowing where it's going to come from. I've said this on the show a lot. So sorry, listeners, but <laughs> one of the craziest things to me still is, you know, my business partner is Scott Marcourt. He's the founder of Stringjoy. That didn't start. I wasn't a co-founder. You know, I didn't start that with him. We didn't know each other at all. Mm. It came from a DM to me on Instagram to come on this podcast. He he messaged me. He was like, hey, I'd love to come on your show. It was like episode 20. And I was like, what are we going to talk about? Guitar strings for an hour? What? Are you kidding me? Like, that was my initial thought. I was like, what are we going to do? We're going to talk about guitar strings for an hour. That sounds dumb. And then we got on the phone before we recorded. I was like, oh, this guy's super cool. We can definitely talk about guitar strings for an hour. <laughs> you know, fast forward to now, I spend anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours a day on the phone with him talking about guitar strings, or at least the, how they relate to the company. Yeah. Because we hit it off and, and he allowed me to become part of the team. And that would have never happened if I hadn't started this podcast. And it's a completely crazy thing. My dad's like, that's weird that you like are a partner in a guitar string company. I'm like, I know, isn't it? Isn't it so strange? Who would have thought that would have ever happened? And that's a little bit outside of the creative world in some ways. But it goes back to that 
saying yes. If I hadn't, if I had just looked at that and thought, I'm not going to talk to this guy, my life would be completely different, Mm -hmm. like completely. And it had nothing to do with numbers or like, I I didn't know him. I didn't know him at all. It was just, I'll take this call. What's the worst that's going to happen? And it was one of the best calls I ever took in my entire life. So, you know, you got to say yes to not everything, but to as many things as you can, Mm -hmm. if they feel right, Yeah, I think is probably the best way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's also getting to the core of what actually feels right to you because you can start to get overwhelmed with all the other pressures of things we think we should be caring about. Again, Mm. you know, the monetary gain I could get from something, you know, what are their numbers looking like? Will I be seen if I do this? Um, But a lot of the times I've, I've found for myself that things feel right to me. And sometimes on paper, look bad, you know, from like a numbers perspective or like a superficial right. perspective. But it, I know that I'd find it fulfilling as an artist. So there you go. That's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we do any of this stuff, right? Yeah. If it, if, you know, there are a lot easier ways to make money than trying to pursue a creative endeavor. <laughs> that's one of the hardest ways to make a living as far as not physically hard, you know, not like being a roofer or something like Mm. that, that's physically very difficult. And, but, or excuse me, but being an artist is, it's a supply and demand thing. Everybody wants to, not everyone, most people want to do something like what we get to do. Mm -hmm. When, when I was a little kid, I thought I wanted to be an author or a radio guy. Weirdly, now I'm a podcaster, so Ah, it's kind of the same thing. I wanted to do something creative with my life. And I, I went down the path of that's never going to happen for most, most of my career prior to this. So we are really fortunate to be able to explore creativity for a living because most people don't get to. And I think a lot of that does come from doing what feels right and letting, letting the heart guide you. you (laughs) Absolutely. You know, for fear of being Disney here for a second. I'm not afraid of being Disney. That's the best thing to be. But yeah, I I think it's so true. I think about it every day. I feel ridiculously lucky that I get to do this and make money doing this. And Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I guess it's it's the way things work at the moment. You have to make money to afford things. (laughs) But that's how it works. But yeah, you know, it's the way it is. But um, the fact that I get to do that doing something that I would do for free. And if anything would pay other people to be able to do <laughs> incredible. <laughs> what an amazing that's thing. A ver- that's a very good point. I I thought that music was going to be something that just cost me money my whole life. Mm-hmm. I, that was my initial thought. I thought this is my <laughs> hobby. That's going to cost me untold thousands of dollars because I'm addicted to gear. <laughs> I did not know that the gear would one day somehow pay me back. Yeah. Like literally, I didn't expect that to happen. I wanted it to happen. I didn't expect it though. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, it's cool. But that goes back to the putting it out there thing. If you, if you don't put it out there, you you know, we wouldn't be talking. This has been a great conversation. We wouldn't have gotten to do this if we both hadn't taken that first step. It's the thing that you got to do. Yeah. And it could literally change your life. So do it, people. Whoever's listening to this, go do it. Go do it. <laughs> Write that record. Go yeah. play that song. Go busk on the corner. Whatever it is you're wanting to do, go do it. Yeah, because I think life's uh, too short and fleeting to not see what happens if you follow things that you, if you do the things that you love. Because I don't know, I, I don't want to regret ever passing up on an opportunity and wondering what could have been, especially when I knew that opportunity felt right for me. I think it's right. even less about me feeling worried that I missed a possible gain from an opportunity. Like, oh, I f- wish I pursued that opportunity because who knows what I would have gained from it, like monetarily or like who would have noticed me or whatever. But more, I regret not doing something that could have been extremely fulfilling to me and made my life mm-hmm. richer. And that's scarier. Um, and 
it's funny. I'm I'm in this time in my life where certain things are coming more full circle where I've kind of, uh, you know, alongside music, always had a deep love for teaching, for speaking and uh, writing and things like that. Um, and yeah, there was a time where I kind of just assumed I wouldn't really be able to do that because I was doing music. I was like, well, I'm doing music. I'm not doing these other things. Uh, but mm-hmm. now with this job that I have, um, you mentioned Natalie at the beginning of the podcast. She, yeah. for those who likely don't know, she <laughs> works <laughs> with the company that I work with, um, which is Musora, that works with Dremio and Guitario. Obviously, that's the side of the company I work with the most um, mm-hmm. and all that. And now I'm getting to do all of these things as well um and they're all connected to music and they're connected to a purpose i really believe in because it's all about education and trying to reach more people to help them you know pursue music um but Mm -hmm. it's now made me realize i mean it's just by luck that i ended up finding this uh job where i was able to come back to some of the passions that i loved that i cast to the side for a bit but it made me think well, I'm lucky. What if that hadn't happened? That would have been really sad because my life is a hundred times better now that I'm doing more of the things that really inspire me, that really make me happy uh, and excited to get out of the bed, in the, get out of my bed in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. And now I don't want to let that happen again. So I'm really trying to get back into all the things that I love pretty much. And it's just seeing what I can do to make them part of my life. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. What does uh, your day to day look like these days? That's actually probably an interesting thing that a lot of people don't think about. I suppose not. Fair enough. People are thinking about their own days. You don't need to be thinking about mine. But (laughs) (laughs) they're listening to you this far. They're thinking about your day. They're wondering what you (laughs) I mean, if they've gotten 43 minutes into this podcast, maybe. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So just recently, I finally took on this uh, full-time position with Guitario. It's nice. funny, these conversations with Jared, um, if people happen to be familiar with Dremio, of course, he's like the guy, he's the CEO of all of this. Right. We went for sushi years ago and he offered this position to me and it, it didn't quite fit at the time. Um, though I was still working with the company for sure, but it was on a more, uh, part-time basis as a contractor. Yeah. But now as of when did I sign the contract? I don't know. Maybe it was a month ago. I mean, I'm doing it full time. Um, and it's also a, just at, at the right time in my life to be doing something like this for so many reasons. But yeah, at the moment I wake up at six 30 in the morning. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh. A little gross. I'm sorry guys. That's rough. And then, um, That's rough. yeah, three days a week I drive from Vancouver to Abbotsford, <laughs> which is like a different city. I don't know. Um, I work there and we do, I mean, we do so much stuff. I'm very inspired by this job at the moment. Um, I get to do a lot of cool stuff and be involved in the direction of the company in many ways, which is such a honor and a very cool role to be able to take on. Uh, And of course we're creating curriculum, recording stuff. We're also, yeah, I don't know. We're just working on a lot of stuff. It's not kind of just music education. There's also, I don't know, interviewing artists or I don't know, whole bunch of stuff uh and you know i work on that and then i come home or if i'm working from home i'm i stay at home i guess <laughs> and i uh work on my own music i you know work on any songs that i'm feeling like i want to write or i create tiktoks and stuff honestly i love to i think it's fun because like at the moment i'm just like doing covers of songs that i really love that i've really always wanted to figure out how to play So that's fun. And then, you know, maybe see a friend that day if I feel like it or if they want to hang out or whatever. Uh, Mm -hmm. I like to go for walks and listen to music. And I do that almost every day. Um, Maybe I'll do a bit of exercise, try to exercise a few times a week. 
I might go drive over to my parents' place so I can visit them and my brother and the dogs, my grandmas, um, if they happen to swing by the house too. I, on weekends, kind of do the same thing minus the working. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then on Sundays, <laughs> uh, usually that's when I get together with Max and Rhett from Ludic and we work on whatever it is we're working on at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. right now we're writing a lot, which is super exciting and super inspiring and fun. And yeah, you know, I try to read before bed when I can. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Just watch Netflix while I'm eating. Cause I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of the vibe of my life at the moment. I like it. That sounds pretty good. It sounds like you got it. Uh, you got it figured out. That sounds very enjoyable. What kind of what kind of things do you like to read? Oh man, I mean, I do really gravitate towards nonfiction, especially stuff mm -hmm. related to psychology and anthropology, philosophy, stuff like that. Uh, though lately, I've just been getting back into fiction because it's just it's more fun to read. <laughs> like, it is. It is. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to like be learning all the time, um, and it takes a lot longer to get through books like that. So I like to space that out um but yeah um what am i reading at the moment what am i reading at the moment i'm reading Let's a book called what is it passing by nelly larson that's a fiction uh it's based on a true story though i know they made a movie that is apparently that's apparently really good because my roommate is also one of my best friends in the whole world she mentioned that she had seen the movie and it was really good and she's like oh there's a book i want to read the book and i was like it sounds like an interesting story. I want to read it as well. So I picked up a copy. Finally, I'm reading it. And then I also have what's this. The, um, uh, what's the what's the gist of it? What is what is, I don't I've never heard. Oh, of it it's before. it's a it's a heavy one. Um, it's set in in the past in the U.S. Um, you know, in in the Jim Crow era, and it's about a black woman who happens to look pretty ambiguous, who passes um as white and you know kind of lives oh. her whole life in that world but then feels this longing to reconnect with you know her culture and you know her people and everything and then she encounters an old-time friend and it's just about the it's from the perspective of um not the person who's passing as white but the other woman um okay. and her really complex feelings in having this person come back into her life and seeing the way she's chosen to live her life and trying to understand why she's done that and what that experience is like. Um, it's a pretty short book. I'm almost all the way through, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. I'm excited to see the movie once I'm done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That does sound good. Yeah. It sounds really I, yeah, like you say, like, I don't know if that's based on a true story or not, but I could super see that happening. Yeah, no, of course. That, I mean, it's obviously based off of a very real time in history and things that and situations that people have had to live through. I just wonder if it is explicitly based off of somebody. Someone. In yeah, I'm yeah. sure a quick Google search would rectify that. It will be done soon because i will be we will google we will google yes. <laughs> we will google and probably not report back but uh because <laughs> this podcast will be over yes so you guys will have to google it too yeah you will google it all together in unison we have to make a pact guys we're all gonna do it <laughs> we're all gonna google this later yeah this is, yeah that way we're all on the same page mm -hmm. that sounds really good yeah, yeah I, I actually just started it sounds kind of weird to say because reading was such an important thing for me growing up mm -hmm. i read 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 Mm -hmm. I just started literally this weekend. Like, I'm like, I haven't read anything in a while. Hmm. That's weird. And there's like a handful of books <laughs> I've been wanting to read, mm -hmm. but I have just not. And it's not, it's not entirely bad. I've been filling that time with a lot of guitar playing. So it's not hey, like, it's nice. not exactly a problem, <laughs> but I, I have been like, I want to read some more. So I just picked up a couple books from a, a store in Seattle this weekend that one in particular, I'm really excited to tear into pretty heavily. Oh, cool. I've wanted to read it for a long time. So, well, what kind of stuff do you uh, like reading? What, what's this book you're I, talking about? This one is actually this one's called "Please Kill Me" 
and mm. it's uh, all about the uh, the punk scene. Oh, cool! Like f- from the early days, uh, and it's a uh, what's the word? It's like an oral history from people who are actually there. Mm. And I've heard I listened to a podcast called No Dogs in Space. It's a huge music podcast, and they cover a lot of punk bands and you know things like that. And they are always referencing. Please kill me. Oh, cool. and they keep saying you got to read if you like punk rock at all. You have to read this book. And I'm like, oh, I love punk rock. Yeah. Why haven't I read this book yet? And I was literally at this store in Seattle. And I just happened to see it out of the corner of my eye. I was like, oh, oh nice. there it is. Give me that thing. Like this is this is the moment. There's one of those things that it's just a random used bookstore that happened to be by the hotel. It's my son fake. wanted to go in there. We went in there, rifled through things. And I was literally like about to leave. I'm like, oh. Please kill me. Perfect. Then want to read that. There so you go. I just started it last night, and so far, very, very good. I That's I really cool. like uh, stories from that scene for some reason. One of yeah. my favorite books growing up was uh, it was called Our Band Could Be Your Life, and it was about like it was like many sections of like about like Black Flag and Dead Kennedys oh, cool. and just like all all those kind of bands. I don't know why that era fascinates me so much. It fascinates me too. <laughs> It really does. I've I've actually really, the past month or so, been uh, enjoying a lot of punk. I don't know what it is. I've just been feeling drawn to that um, style of music. And yeah, definitely that era in particular, like when punk really kind of started becoming a thing, I guess, throughout the 70s. And then especially in the 80s, you had some pretty great bands coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's a really interesting scene. And even trying to understand stuff like the riot girl scene and um, where that comes Absolutely. from. And yeah, it's, it's all really, it's cool. I'm also fascinated by those stories and also um, obviously an offshoot of punk grunge. I feel like the stories that have come from that scene also fascinate me. Cause uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of darkness there too. Maybe that's why Absolutely. it's a morbid thing, yeah. but it's also super interesting because I feel like it's a, deeply human type of music where it's about expressing i don't know primal human feelings but also very meaningful observations about the world we're living in and critiques of the world we're living in and the situations mm-hmm. people are subjected to and everything so it's it's really interesting i love it I think what I think that primal nature is what's always drew me to it. Mm-hmm. I've always, always been into it. And I've had a few times in my life where I could just like really release like that, <laughs> you know, and just ah! I've just been feeling like, primal it, lately. You know? Oh, it feels <laughs> good to just scream into a microphone sometimes. It just <laughs> does. You know, I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. It doesn't even have to sound good to anyone else. Sometimes I've, I've gotten so worked up, you know, that. I'm just out of myself. Yeah. There was actually a song that I did on my solo record where I, I literally was laying on the floor, like pounding the keyboard on my, my little Yamaha. Uh, I forget what the model is, but it's a little Yamaha keyboard with a bunch of vintage uh, electric piano sounds in it. Oh, nice. And I had it ran out to two tube amps and ran into a bunch of pedals. And I was literally on the floor, just pounding on it. <laughs> And it's the most guitar sounding thing on the record. It's really funny. That's cool. It, I need to hear this. Like That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's and I I got done and I was like, whoo, who, where did I go? Who like, was I that guy a second ago? <laughs> yeah, and I was completely by myself out here. Wow. It was just this the sound waves that did it to me somehow. I don't mm-hmm. know how that happened. It was really weird. That's really interesting. But, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the that's the punk rock thing that appeals to me is that Mm -hmm. being able to just fully release yeah i mean that's that's sonic what it's all about yeah yeah well hey we're getting to the end of the podcast and i have a few classic questions i like to wrap up on all right but before i do that i like to let the guests take the stage you know you're talking to a few thousand people right now what would you like to say to them you can shout out your grandma you can plug anything you want to plug you can say whatever you want to say oh absolutely shout out my grandmas i love them they're the best people on the planet, hundred percent. Grandmas rule. They do. I love. I love my grandmas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. Have a peaceful, wonderful life. To anyone 
<laughs> I almost said go. reading this. There's no way you're reading this. This is a podcast. To anyone listening. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I'm excited. I'm writing music. I recorded my first single over the summer. Going to release it in February. Ooh, I'm recording another nice. single in a few weeks at the end of October. And then, I don't know. It's just... Time to put out music. I'm definitely going to put out more music with my band Ludic. And most of all, again, I hope you have a good day, listener. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good, uh, that it's... was a good mic drop right there. <laughs> you have a good have day. Have a good day. Boom. Mic drop. Yep. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Classic questions. All right. First one. What is your favorite boss pedal? metal zone <laughs> i'm kidding yeah. i mean i also have the the wazacraft chorus i do love that a lot the wazacraft chorus that is a, yeah that's, that's a, a good one. one but mostly the metal mm -hmm. zone guys <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying it's pretty cool i'm just saying it, it, gets, run through it, it the, gets a lot of hate but i like it run through the effects loop guys mm -hmm. come on or just just play with the eq yeah like the the problem with the metal zone and I've said this many times. The problem with it is that it's so flexible. It's easy to get a bit bad sound out of it. Yeah. But if you don't, don't look at it. Just turn the knobs and just find something that sounds. I guarantee you can find something cool in there. So it is an extremely flexible EQ. Reading between the lines, you're saying if it sounds bad, it's the person, not the pedal. <laughs> no. No, no, that's what I'm you're just saying. saying. No, actually, no, that's, that's what, I'm, what saying. I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's, what, that's no, my I'm statement. I'm just saying <laughs> so many people uh, try, and I, I'm guilty of this too. They hear with their eyes. You know, if, like a DS1 is a great example of this. Yeah. If you set a DS1's tone control where you think you should visually, it sounds terrible. Mm. Like if you think you set the tone control at like, like you know, one, one or two o'clock where you would with a lot of uh, drives and distortions, it's awful so much high end i don't know why it's designed that way there's so much high end mm -hmm. you back it off to say i don't know nine ten o'clock it sounds really good you have to use kurt cobain settings that's right he got that's a right. nice tone out of those he did he did and he smashed them he did all kinds of crazy things sure did. so yeah yeah we all need to try to hear with our ears not our eyes mm -hmm. that's myself included i'm saying that to me too so yes anyway all right, final question, and this is the one that gets a little dicey. This is the one that gets people kind of. Who did you vote up. for? And I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, who did you vote for? <laughs> what is your stance on? No. What is your favorite kind of pizza? Hmm. I mean, my relationship to pizza has changed a bit because um, I, I went vegan sometime in the past mm -hmm. couple years. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna say a classic margarita pizza. Does it for me? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I love basil. A well done. So it's great. Yeah, a well done margarita is it's a special thing. Oh, you know, no doubt. And you know, little, throw little some um, chili flakes on there can be really good too to add a little extra seasoning and spice on there. Mm hmm. Do you have a favorite pizzeria? Oh, what a good question. Hmm. I'm still exploring vegan pizza in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. If you ask me if I have a favorite ramen spot, I'd have like a lot of answers okay. for you. Okay, tell me the I'm, I love ramen. Tell me. Your yeah. Okay. Ramen okay. Because I'm more into mm -hmm. like noodles more than anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> noodles so are great. in Vancouver, and this is like from a vegan ramen perspective. I'm gonna okay. say no brainer. Zubu was always at the top for me, but recently I went to Danbo and I finally found the right order. Because the thing with Danbo, if anyone's ever been there, you can customize like every single part of it okay and so i've just been trying a bunch of different things and it was always really good but not zubu level but recently i started uh ordering their miso ramen um which seems obvious mm -hmm. but they have a bunch of different broths so i just hadn't gotten there yet and okay they have a vegan egg it comes with and you can get it's really really good vegan gyoza if they haven't run out of it as well <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. It's really good. Now it, it might be up there with Zubu for me. They're really different, but they're both super tasty. Um, then I put Jinya a second. Jinya's good. Their vegan ramen is good, but it's 
not quite the same, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Oh, I love ramen. I don't have a lot yes. of, I don't have a lot of good ramen that's, I mean, if I go clear into Portland, I'm just outside of Portland. If I go clear into Portland, I got several options. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But in my, in my immediate neck of the woods, I don't really have a lot of ramen options. I'm sorry. It's, like, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's a tough. It's a, it's very difficult to live my life. You know, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, this is the hardest it's, it's not, thing it's not. someone could go through. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I just, yeah, this... <laughs> I moved out um, a few months ago and I'm in the part of the city. I'm in a part of the city where there, for some reason, is this amazing concentration of Southeast Asian restaurants a few blocks from me. Oh. Amazing oh. Vietnamese food. Mm. I'm living it up, ordering my lemongrass tofu vermicelli all the time. So good. That sounds great. Yeah. Oh, man. I know what I'm having for lunch. <laughs> I'm going to the Thai place because that's oh, the closest nice. good Asian restaurant to me. So, yeah. Yes. Gotta love a good mm -hmm. pad thai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was a blast. I really enjoyed the conversation. I wasn't sure where it was going to go, but I like where it went. That was Me great. Too. It was an enjoyable thank conversation you. for sure. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Likewise. All right, everybody. For Ayla, this is Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. Okay, there you go, folks. There is another episode in the can. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I super appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the show and get extra episodes beamed directly to your ears every week, along with the ad-free version of this episode, or all of the episodes moving forward, go to patreon.com slash tone mob. For three bucks a month, you get access to just the ad-free feed. So if the new format is not working for you, that is the way you get around that. Three bucks a month and you get the totally ad-free version of this podcast. For five bucks a month, not only do you get the ad-free version, but you get access to the bonus episodes. That's right, the bonus episodes. There are more conversations. There are hundreds, yes, hundreds of hours behind that wall. And if you want to support the show and get those extra episodes, that is how you do it. Go check out patreon.com slash tone mob. And I super appreciate everybody that helps with that. It is incredibly helpful. I cannot tell you how incredibly helpful that really is, especially during these weird times. And if you can't, if that just isn't in the cards for you, I totally understand. Honestly, listening to this is just huge. The fact that you are here right now hearing this is absolutely immense. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you could get one other person to listen to this, if everybody listened to this podcast could get a uh, half a person as a data point, because obviously half people don't exist. But if you could get just like a few people here and there hooked on the show, that would be absolutely insane. And it's the best thing that you could do for this thing moving forward. Because as I've said before, audio podcasts have no algorithm. There's really nothing pushing these things. It's all up to the host and the team behind it and the fans of the podcast. And as for the team behind this one, this is it. This is it right here. You've got Nick who's doing the editing for me. Shout out Nick. He's amazing. But as far as pushing the podcast along to more listeners... This is the guy doing it. So if you could help me do that, it would be immensely, immensely appreciated. All right. I'm kind of rambling, folks. I will talk to you all next week. I hope you have a good one. See you on the internet. Bye-bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? 
Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gun Street harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and check them out. Hi, this is Paul Phelps. And this is Monica Strutt. And we're from the Daily Music Business Podcast. We're joined by a number of other really great hosts in creating daily content with great advice for independent musicians just like you. That's right. We put out episodes daily on all topics from music marketing to branding, advice on signing with a manager and label and anything else you need to up level the business side of your music career. We've got it covered. Subscribe to the Daily Music Business Podcast today on your favorite podcast catcher. Subscribe today to the Daily Music Business Podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, this is Chris Santos, host of Delirious Nomads, the Blacklight Media Podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Delirious Nomads is a podcast about all things heavy metal, as well as breakdowns of your favorite combat sports. And me being a chef and all, we'll be riffing on some food talk every week with very special guests from across the globe. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com.